give me a sense of how your organization, your members, are regarding the, the stakes here on the Supreme Court pick. For millions of people across the country, hundreds of millions, uh, arguably, this is a life or death fight. People are very, very consciously aware that a vote for any of the uh, Supreme Court nominees that Trump has laid out on his shortlist is a vote to end Roe. It's to criminalize abortion. And it's also a vote to roll back protections for LGBT people and to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. People feel this very personally in their lives, really like nothing since the health care fight, where people understood the stakes for their own lived experience and fought accordingly. I think that's, that's kind of the roadmap for how we're going to fight this battle, uh, just the same way we defeated the uh, repeal of the Affordable Care Act legislatively. And yet, Ben, is that is that possibly overstated? Because I talked to some conservative legal people in Washington who say, no, 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 it's not going to be an overturn of Roe versus Wade. What's more likely is it'll stay on the books. States will bring up various restrictions on abortion that may be upheld by this new Supreme Court, but it may be whittled away some, but really overturning Roe versus Wade, do you think that's in the cards in the next, say, five years? There might be some strategists who want to whittle it away with, with small cuts here and there, but there are going to be lots of states that pass these, you know, six-week abortion bans and send those all the way up to the Supreme Court. And, you know, time and again, it's going to be hammered away. I think the, the chance that any of these four nominees actually holds the line and, and votes to sustain Roe as a precedent is unlikely. And even if they, you know, come sort of a flat immediate overturning, they're going to find ways to totally undermine and destroy it so that abortion access and reproductive freedom uh, ends as a right that Americans enjoy. And again, from the position of uh, progressives, is there another way in which life or death may be hanging in the balance? And that is with respect to so-called Obamacare, mm -hmm. the Affordable Care Act, because there have been various attempts to overturn that and strike it down. Uh, how concerned are your members that, in fact, that could shift the balance and, in fact, we do away with whatever's left of the Affordable Care Act? In the Affordable Care Act uh, fight, I worked closely with a group of parents, especially mothers of children with serious, uh, you know, uh, medical abnormalities, complex medical issues, children who rely on Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act protections for people with pre-existing conditions to be able to get insurance coverage and to be able to survive. They are worried now. I'm getting messages from people who are terrified about what this Supreme Court pick will mean for their families, for their children's survival. This, it's, it's striking very close to home. And that's, that's going to translate into political energy to fight against a pick who would do something disastrous. So the stakes are high yes. for you and for your members. Yes. Uh, is there any realistic prospect of stopping the confirmation process of this nominee? I mean, these, these are four very qualified judges. There's no question about that. On the legal merits, they're qualified. Is there any real prospect, do you think, of stopping in the Senate? There is. And the reason to, to think that is to look back at the health care fight. In that fight, Democrats had actually one fewer seat in the Senate. This time, we need 51 votes to win. Democrats have 49 votes in the Senate. And we, we think that there's a real path through Alaska and Maine especially to be able to make clear that this is about a vote on fundamental principles that uh, Senator Murkowski and Senator Collins have repeatedly proclaimed and voted on in the past. That's the, that's the way we do this, uniting Democrats, holding a couple of Republicans off to make clear that an extreme nominee who wants something that two-thirds of Americans oppose, which is ending Roe, uh, is, is off the table. So you mentioned the two Republicans particularly. What about holding the Democrats? Because you also have West Virginia, you have North Dakota, you have some senators running in states that really voted for Donald Trump. Trump, and they're up for election in what could be bitterly fought contests. Those senators are, you know, have, have, have made clear they're going to be talking to each other and looking carefully at the nominee. I also think that if Collins and Murkowski come out against a Trump nominee, that it'll be very possible to hold Democrats together. And it's certainly the case that the constituents of those senators who they need to vote for them, to knock on doors for them, to donate for them, uh, to, to be reelected this cycle, do not want any of these extremist nominees on the bench. Well, but, but if you're talking about Murkowski and Collins as a practical matter, let's play this out. Yeah. Uh, whoever the nominee is, they know they're not going to go in to that confirmation hearing and say, oh, yes, I'm going to vote to overturn Roe Ro Ro against Wade. Quite the opposite. They're going to say, I believe in stare decisis. I believe in precedent. I don't believe in turning things out take every case as it comes up. Will that kind of answer be enough to actually get Collins and or Murkowski to vote against this nominee? The burden of proof is on the nominee to show that they're not ready to throw out established law and to throw out Roe. Uh, the, the question is whether they'll be allowed to skate by. I think if they are, then it's a clear signal from Murkowski and Collins that they actually do not have the, the pro-choice principles that have been a hallmark of their political career. They know that this is not something you can fudge, because sooner, probably sooner rather than later, the question is going to be called the Supreme Court will, will rule, and their, you know, their 2020 re-election bids will be up for grabs as well. This is not the only project you've got going on right now. There's something called the midterms that are coming up in November as well. If you were to win in basically defeating 
his nominee uh, in the Senate, could it hurt progressives, Democrats, in the midterm elections? Because it would really create a powerful issue for Republicans. So the fact is, this is going to energize both sides, and that's going to happen regardless of what happens with this nominee. For progressives, it's, it's now clear that Republicans are going to do all that they can. They're going to spend huge amounts of money. They're going to push very far-right nominees, and this might not be the only Supreme Court seat left in the, in the Trump administration's term. So this is going to fire up the left. It's also going to fire up the right, again, no matter whether this uh, immediate nominee is confirmed or not, because of the future nominees and because of the, the sense of energy that comes out of the fight we're about to have. So there's no question the temperature has been raised on both sides, the, if Democrats fall down rather than fighting, then they're going to dispirit the base. And that is something that no candidate wants.